What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. This week, it's going to be a full episode. Episode number 121 is with a guest, and the guest is Toby Mancuso. Toby works for a company called Track Capital, uh, which is based in the UK, and that is a property investment firm. But what's interesting is they actually also have recently opened a division in Dubai. Now, I'm going to allow Toby do the usual kind of explanation as to what they do and all that kind of stuff. The interview is going to have all of the usual good stuff, like the his background and how he got into property. But what I think is going to be interesting, uh, later in the discussion, Toby opens up on his thoughts about the market. Now, there's been an awful lot of talk uh, about inflation in the UK and the Bank of England about to raise interest rates and things like that. And this can obviously be a worrying time for property investors. So Toby is going to give his sort of view on the market, the, the way it could move and all that kind of stuff. And then I asked him a question around what is uh, what would he invest his money in? Like if he had 200000 sitting in a bank account, where in the UK would he invest it? And uh, he's going to list out various cities that he is interested in and why. And so I think it's going to be a valuable episode to any investor, but also a lot of investors that are based in the UK. So anyway, look, without further ado, let's jump straight into my conversation with Toby Mancuso. You're listening to Behind the Facade, and I'm your host, Gavin J. Gallagher. On this podcast, I explore the mental and emotional game often playing out subconsciously, both in your mind and the mind of everyone else in the real estate or property investment market. The key to success in this game is to master your mindset and your behavior, to take control of your thoughts, your emotions, and most importantly, your ego. Welcome to the show. Toby Mancuso, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, Toby, just normally the way I kick off these conversations is just a li- tell us a little bit about who Toby is and what he does and where he's based. Yeah. So thanks for the introduction. So my main property company is called Track Capital. So we're a property investments specialist company where we deal with buy to let investments, but Uh, specifically for the off-plan and new build market. So um, if any of the listeners sort of aren't too familiar with that, that will be where you're purchasing a property as an investment during the construction period. So that can be just as they're putting a shovel in the ground uh, anyway up till completion. And we do have some developments that are completed. But the way I like to sort of really break it down is we're effectively like an estate agent, but just for buy-to-lets on the new build and off-plan sector. So a lot of our clients will be Hands off, remote armchairs, armchair investors looking to put their money into uh, UK investments and Dubai as well. Uh, what we sort of are going into at the moment, um, and we mainly focus on sort of city centre or regeneration areas where we can look for a, a nice, nice mix of capital growth, but also yield at the same time to make sure we, we're looking to get healthy returns for them. Sounds great. Um, we're going to get into all of that, and I'd like to actually one of the things I'll delve into is. When it comes to buying off plan, um, maybe you'll give us some guidelines as to how um, you manage that. Because um, I, I know from from previous experience investing abroad myself that uh, when you're buying off plan, you know you're putting money down, but you don't actually have title yet, and so therefore you have to actually have cash to put down as opposed to being able to borrow and things like that. We'll get into that in a bit, but first. I kind of think it's always good to start with a little bit of context and you're a you're in your 30s and you're in you based in the UK property what got you into the property sector in the first place I I fell into property kind kind of accidentally in in a way so originally when I was 19 I actually um my family business was uh, sort of pubs and restaurants so when I was 19 I actually bought a pub um sort of mid recession um as well so it was obviously we could pick them up for, for good prices so I, that, that was what i did initially um and then it was obviously it was tough you're running your own business pubs are quite hard and my my who's my wife now she fell pregnant and she was at the time working as an estate agent and i needed some extra money 
um because obviously we've got a baby on the way so i was like right got to start bringing in a little bit more money so luckily with with the pub i was able to step away slightly w- work more sort of a back office side and then i had my sort of brother who could um, my father to get involved and help him sort of with that as well so then because she was going off on maternity it was sort of like a, a, a one of her family uh, sort of family members um estate agency uh, said look well look my my partner will take over my role if you want because you're going to need somebody and yeah at first he actually didn't want to take me because I was um obviously part of the sort of a family so he's like look, I don't want to mix that if it gets awkward etc yeah. etc so I offered to work for him for free I said look give me a chance give me a week for free and if if you like me and if I like it we'll, we'll carry on luckily did really well he asked to keep me on and then from there, um, I kind of just fell in love with the whole property industry from that point. Uh, got a bit of a bug for it because um, obviously going around, you're doing different properties. So I definitely found it a valuable experience. So I got to see a lot of different range of properties, new builds, um, Victorian properties, a lot of secretary market, obviously, of course, uh, flats, um, houses. And, and when date? When was the date around that you started all this? So that was, I must have been, well, I had Eliana's eight now. So it was just before she was, that's about, God, no, about 24, I must have been actually. Maybe, no, 24 or 23, I think it was when I started that. Um, so 13, no, no, 13, 14. Yes, it must have been about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah so okay. 2013. Yeah. So the so market was, was just. The market was starting to kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. I'm, and it's, it's southeast as well. So we were we're near, Gat- we're near Gatwick Airport was where I was based. Um, So started to pick up. So don't get me wrong. It was um, it was still a, a difficult market to maneuver in the sense of people weren't forthcoming and obviously paying, asking, a lot of negotiating, a lot of viewings to take place. It wasn't like the market we see today where you have a queue of buyers and that's it. It goes yeah. crazy. We had to do a lot of work, which again, very valuable, but yeah, I, I sort of fell in love with it there. And at that point, um, I kind of said to my, to my brother at the time, I said, look, we should just buy a property as an investment. Cause I can see a lot of landlords that was coming across and I was starting to take a sort of keen sort of interest in what they were doing. So then we, we snapped up a property that we had came on. I kind of said to, to my brother, I said, look, I think we should go for this. It's, I think it's a great price and it sort of service in the long term." And we did, we've still got that property today. And then from there, I started to get a bit more interested in the property investment side. Then I moved to a different branch um, for, for, for that company and went to sort of more sorry way um and yeah then that was it sort of property became my thing and i started to started to sort of follow when i was speaking to landlords ask them sort of questions about what they do and how that what their portfolio is doing and sort of try and get ideas and and build see a if profile I could yeah, as to how, yeah how it, it exactly yeah and then um then I've always had that entrepreneurial streak in me where obviously buying the pub at 19, so my family have run their own businesses. So I was quite constrained in the estate agency company that I was with. Great, great company. It was a, a smallish independent. So again, it was a nice little mix of structure, but still a bit of flexibility because it was an independent. Um, you can see behind the scenes a little bit as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I, I did really like that and, and gained a lot from that, but I sort of outgrew because I, Again, I always wanted to do more, always wanted to sort of try and improve things, but there was only so far that could be done there. So um, at, then I actually had to sort of kind of step away and take a break because my, my dad um, got a little bit ill. He's, he's fine now, but he needed to calm down. So I said, well, look, what I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll step back into the family business because we still had a couple of pubs at the time. And I said, look, I'll, I'll manage these, but my plan is I'm, I'm going to do this for maybe a year while, while everything settles and get structure in place. And then I'll go back into property. So my plan was to either get an estate agency maybe or a lettings business to, to run that because obviously I knew that um, and do that myself. Um, or then I sort of was investing in property myself. We bought an uh, investment in, in Leeds, myself and my brother, an investment. So I thought, I thought, well, look, maybe I can assist people doing this because a lot of people I was speaking to didn't know how to invest. And so that's when I came across uh, Nick uh, with Track Capital. And yeah, and then it sort of went from from there and bought into that. And yeah, we we sort of fully launched and and been going ever since really in the last how long two years okay yeah and uh, nick is based in dubai i understand yeah yeah correct so 
he 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 founded um track capital around 2000 i think it was about 2017 18 maybe just just started looking into it because again he'd had experience in what we do sort of the uh, off plan and new build market he'd worked for a company um and then he he sort of did it sort of on his own but very very strict um sort of budget there and capital so unfortunately he had a developer um default on him so he couldn't get paid and that kind of dried up his marketing spend and in our business it's to, to generate the leads and 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 get sort of um the investors in it's, it's a high sort of marketing spend right. there so then I, I i came across him we had we had a conversation and really hit it off we, we both sort of sort of benefit each other quite well different characters so sort of gelling together sort of seemed like a really good idea and then um yeah i came on board around 2019 um in, in the background sort of working within the business and then um fully sort of signed all, all, all the sort of paperwork to to go ahead um it was actually just around the, when the pandemic kicked off so um, yeah i was just that was my next question is you know given the pandemic came along in the middle of all this like how did that impact you did that was that a benefit or or a, a kind of a curse it, at, at the time i would have said oh my god what worst time to to put money and start sort of relaunching in a sense a business but um it, it, it is it was actually probably the that's not the best thing that's probably not the best words to use but it was it was very beneficial the reason being is because obviously i was i was going to transition because obviously I was going to move out back from the family business and transition back out and with the structures being in place there. But I kind of was able to do that a lot quicker because the pub shut down. So we weren't actually yeah. working in the pub. So what that gave me was 100% time to then work on track capital. And because the property um, was one of very few industries that carried on sort of fully and actually expanded in a sense and did very well and and um yeah was, was busy we yeah we actually probably grew a lot quicker than we had have anticipated because we had that full focus um and the market generally did very well and yeah. when i was when the pandemic did hit a lot of the sort of research and data i was looking at although a lot of the stuff was looking gloomy and quite sort of down my inkling was that it's not what i could see i, I could see it was it was it wasn't definitely going to be as bad as people thought and i had actually predicted that it was going to not do as well as it did that year but i did say like i think it's going to ca carry on as it is with everything going on and yeah that that managed to help um yeah help us grow very very quickly actually tell, tell me this toby the, the the background in pubs and stuff has that served you well in the in the property context yeah it definitely has i think from from a mix of uh, property and of course business i think that the work ethic sort of picked up um working in that side it's it's, it's a very sort of hard graft and very hands-on and i think that's quite similar to property in a sense especially in, in most aspects that um obviously you can delegate and have structures in place but at certain points or certain deals or depending on what stage you're at you do need that sense of hands-on um you do need because property is a business in in, in most senses to obviously depend on what aspect you are in but it is effectively a business so having that sort of business acumen to to look at deals and step away and take emotion out as well um and yeah i think just mainly sort of the the long hard slog of it all as well um is is something that definitely helped me and from an operational point of view i was kind of just thinking about if i had experience running pubs i could go off and i'd be looking at buying pubs that might have some sort of a property angle have you done have you done that kind of thing in it yes so that kind of helped me see the benefit of actually being a landlord as well because what we started to do is um the pubs upstairs were massive so i was like right let's just rent out the rooms so again we started to generate so we would basically because we, we had the the leases on a long on, on a basis from the brewery because the brewery well, the council owns them then the brewery takes a lot lifetime lease basically right. um, and then we get that from the brewery so um and the way i saw it was like oh look we control we control the property we can do what we want in there we, it's, it's ours so then i started to look at it from that point of view and then i did look at op started to look at um potential options where you could then like you said convert them into flats and stuff but it wasn't an avenue i kind of didn't go down fully i think because i lacked that sort of building experience to a sense i had the investment experience and the right right that side of things i didn't have that next step but i know i've got people sort of 
within the, my network that have done it and done well well from it and sometimes i'll give them a sort of bit of advice here and there to be fair well yeah i mean it's it's handy when you when you've got a kind of a a feel for the pub business you can know straight away walking into a place whether this is going to work or not and if it's not going to work well then okay what can it be instead of a pub or whatever so you have that benefit um i'm curious about the dubai market uh i mean i spent a couple of years there about 10 years ago now at this stage and you you and uh nick you're you're active in like how do you manage uk focus and dubai focus is it that you split the roles between yourself and nick or do you spend time working on the dubai stuff as well yeah so it's um it is a bit of a split um i would say at the moment as as a business our, our core focus is the uk market because the, the, we've just launched the dubai side but yeah because nick is based in dubai and we have the office out in dubai um which which he heads up um he would he has the main focus there so he's he's obviously managing the developer relationships and if we have uk clients going to visit out there then he can sort of meet with them or uh, arrange the meetings if they want to go to sites or meet developers etc so he he's the main sort of focus on that but in terms of the sales aspect aspect um it's it is actually kind of probably split um but mainly sort of because i head up more of the sales side of the business it would be more sort of on me on that side so we, we right. kind of split it that way and Tony, uh, and nick looks after the the investors or something like that is that is, do you split it like that no so it's, it's it'd be on a client by client basis okay. so um so if, if it's for example um a couple of uh the the sales team at track capital have done a couple of just all, all organic to buy deals uh this month just with their clients who have been buying and looking in the uk so they will effectively manage that that client because we, we like to have a sort of personable service yeah. so if, if you're speaking with myself it would be myself that you deal with of course they they're not always the most familiar with dubai because it's quite new to them on the sales team so they'll just obviously liaise with myself and nick and we can sort of have group zoom calls or with with the client just but the main hand holding is is done via the the sales consultant they'll be dealing with right okay yeah um in terms of just uh, one of the one of the things that I've done over the years investing abroad is, um, you you know, it, it takes a little bit of getting your getting a feel for the market. Um, I mean, going over to Dubai and uh, and kind of advising on clients that are looking at investing there and stuff like that. Like, what would you say are the benefits of the Dubai market from, say, a UK investor thinking of investing abroad? I think the first thing which is which is massive in the Dubai market is is the payment plans actually, um, which I think is a man massive benefit because it kind of opens access to more UK purchasers because you don't have to have a always a cash lump sum at this moment in time because they have very attractive payment plans. It might be twenty percent down and maybe the uh, further thirty percent spread over maybe four or five years depending on the build. So that's the first thing I think is quite uh, a benefit for UK buyers. Um, I think this, the second is it's such an emerging market that when you look at the the value of the Dubai property market in comparison to other major cities like take London for example to get a one bedroom flat in the middle of sort of London or the even sort of the outskirts of, of a popular area of London is is astronomical price at the moment in terms of investment just doesn't really stack up for maybe just your your average retail investor for example but and the yields are paper thin as well yeah. ex exactly but then when you when you then take the um Dubai market and you look at the comparison price per square foot like for like in our opinion, Dubai is still massively undervalued because it, and that's because it's a growing emerging market. So when you look at other major cities across across the world, um, like New York, for example, all these sort of cities, um, Dubai for us is still very attractive because of the prices. And I think that's the one thing when we when we speak to UK investors, especially. And they they inquire on Dubai, and then we mention a price point to them. Like we're saying, you can pick up a, a one bedroom flat in a in a desirable up and coming area, close distance to downtown Dubai, or or maybe the Palms, sort of very close proximity, and you can pick these up for 150 to 200 grand, depending on the spec or or the developer. And they're kind of taken back a bit because they're they're expecting to hear London prices and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, so I think that's something that's definitely been an eye opening for for the investors that we're speaking to. And when you're in looking at doing a uh, like, let's move back to the UK market for a second. Uh, you're doing buy to let. 
when when somebody is thinking about doing a buy to let or to say a buying off plan i should say mm-hmm. um one of the biggest issues is obviously that you don't get access to any bank debt or anything like that uh, so do you have a kind of a structure for actually getting people committed to a deal but they don't actually know what the borrowing is going to be and whether they're going to you know like talk us through the process that you have there yeah so this is something we always go over with our clients because it's not something they actually initially think of or over over time actually think of so what we like to do is obviously because like you said you haven't got access to that 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 lending so you don't know what the rates are going to be by the time it completes or what products are going to even going to be available so the main process we have is like first of all speak to a mortgage broker about your situation right this second what the market's looking right now although it's not necessarily transferable to what it will be in the future but you need to know that what you're in position at the moment is a minimum for you'd be able to get lending because if not then there's no point really having a conversation until you are at that point so once they've done that and they are comfortable we can then go through look we now need to look at the worst case scenario so maybe your circumstances change maybe you lose your job so have you got a plan b or c have you got funds maybe you've got expected to come in or maybe you can draw from other avenues if not we then have a worst worst case scenario where what we can do is we we, we make the contract assignable so if worst case scenario by the time the property is going to be built you are unable to go ahead and and fulfill that completion we have the option where we can assign your contract to another buyer. So that's kind of your worst case scenario, get out clause, but we always have to check that some developers don't always offer it. um, But most do. And if they don't, you can usually ask them and that they can add it in there because again, it's a benefit for the buyer and security to the buyer. So that's really the the main sort of backup plan that we have for, for most purchasers. And just, I mean, a kind of a, the first thing that pops into mind when I hear about assignability is that, you're going to get the people that want to try and flip a property and so yeah. assign it on for a profit. Do you get that kind of thing or is that restricted? You know, you do. And it's something that people do. It's not a strategy that I tend to recommend. I, I always say, look, if the op- option is there by the time you come to completion, obviously explore it. But for me, I always recommend have that as maybe a, a secondary option. If you do need to take it, you're best off just going in the mindset that you're going to hold the asset and you're going to be renting it out. But yeah, we get people that, um, do that and there are some people that can can make some some decent sort of money off doing that as well but for me i just find it a bit too risky to to recommend it is that risky to people. i have a funny i remember back in 2008 and uh, when the recession was just kicking off and i can remember uh somebody i know very well he 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 called me up and he was like yeah, Gavin, you know, I've, I've, I put a deposit down, I put 40 grand down on this, uh, this place. He said, I just don't like how the market looks right now. Um, do you think he'll give me back my deposit? And I was just like, <laughs> are you kidding? Like, not only is he not going to give it back, but he's going to pursue you to complete the deal. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, there's no walking away from a commitment like and uh, no. sure enough they he did get pursued and he ended up having to do the deal. But people go in with this kind of Oh, I'm amazed at how people can go in so blind that they think like, oh yeah, I'll just put down this money and like sign this contract. What the hell, you know? And I yeah. can flip it on uh, hopefully later. And if it doesn't work, I'll just get my money back. So um, that was an interesting one. <laughs> I, I mean, I yeah, I that really sort of confused me because again, as a company, we're, we're always very transparent and we try to give people the worst case scenario. So they, we always say, look, if something doesn't go to, doesn't go to plan, as long as we've pre-warned you and you've got that in the backyard hopefully you could sort of have a a plan b or c for that but the amount of people that just go in like you said either it goes over the head they don't listen i don't know or how naive they are but i mean again i just question what's their what's their conveyancer or solicitor saying to them are they not sitting them down because i mean if you buy in a limited company now you have to pay three four hundred pounds to have a sit down with um a, a separate um solicitor to advise you you're signing the mortgage and you're liable for it and you have to pay for that service to have that extra bit of advice because of because of how big that commitment is yeah. so i'm very surprised they haven't got something similar like that for this because it's like you're exchanging off plan you need to be well aware of what your uh, liability are should anything uh, you, you change your mind etc but apparently it's not not a done thing yeah uh, people are people can be fairly um 
fairly kind of lax when it comes to stuff that you're not actually paying for today. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's kind of like, it's the never, never it's down in the future. It's like, Oh, you know, I'll think about all those problems later, but actually you're committing to it today. Uh, a lot of the time. Um, Toby, the way the market is right now, I mean, this is something that we could, I, I'm kind of curious about because just in the last couple of days, the, the bank of England have come out and said that, you know, inflation is a major, major issue. And and certainly I'm I'm based in Ireland now and I, and I and I'm seeing it every day like the cost of living has gone up and I'm seeing a lot of headlines in the in the papers about your um, the the cost of fuel fueling your home and stuff it's gone up to something like four thousand is the average now um, this surely is going to impact the property market in terms of affordability I mean I know demand and supply are really out of kilter. And so there's always going to be that. But at the end of the day, with interest rates rising and with inflation rising as well, there's a point where things become kind of difficult to fund and stuff. Do you do you see that or do you have you any concerns or where do you think it's going? Yeah, concerns I'd say, I wouldn't say I'd be concerned. I mean, I think we're definitely... We're, there's going to be hesitance in the market. Um, whenever confidence is knocked, there's always a sense of hesitance. We always have, we had it around coronavirus. We had it around Brexit, all that sort of stuff. When um, as soon as confidence knocks, that that's a natural occurrence. Um, I think the for me, one of the main fundamentals which is going to keep the the property market um, moving along nicely and steady is, is how I describe it is like you mentioned the massive supply and demand imbalance because I think naturally you will have an aspect of the market taken taken out due to like you said affordability funds are tight maybe they're not got the money that they they, they thought they did or they're going to sort of tighten down the hatches a little bit more um, and then you'll have people that will just be cautious because they they want to see what the market's going to do they don't like investing in an uncertain market take those out of um the the equation there's still going to be a hefty chunk of demand still there whether that's investors whether that's just people moving up and down the house ladder um and the supply is still massively massively low so yes we will see i think a slight cooling down and a, um, a steadiness but i think it's going to remain quite say resilient in a sense that it will sort of carry on doing well because that fundamental supply and imbalance is massive people still need homes as well people need to move so people are gonna are gonna do that um, and i think what you will then find is we have to break it down hyper locally as well because certain areas of the country like london and the south maybe will have more of a stall than the other areas of the country which were more affordable because when you look at the affordability levels in these other areas they're still relatively attractive so that's going to do one or two things you're going to have people in the in those areas still buying because technically they cost of living is tighter for them but they had a little bit of a margin anyway so they'll be okay again you'll have a small bit of the market drop out um, and then when you look at investors well, the smart investors will just go to the areas which they can still see as affordable and they'll be able to still get the yields. And again, if they're investing medium to long term, they'll be snapping up. So when you, again, when you look at these Northwest, Northeast areas, they're still sort of lagging way behind maybe the sort of areas down here in the South where people mm. are a bit more cautious. So yeah, I think my, my outlook is I think in two, over the next two years or so, I think while the economy is having a slight correction, because I don't think I know people keep saying recession, but my personal opinion, when I'm looking at some of the economists that are speaking and what they're saying, some behavioral economists as well, um, they're kind of anticipating, well, look, although the talk of recession is what's theoretically taking place um, because the definition of recession, we're not having what we had in the financial crash. And that's another thing, financial crash, you actually couldn't buy because you couldn't you can get money lent to you so yeah. that again stops that demand there where we haven't got that issue this time people who still have capital still have access to lending um and again a lot of the lenders some people will say oh they're pulling their products and putting their rates up the reason they're doing that when you speak to sort of mortgage brokers in the know is because they're oversaturated with demand. They can't keep up with demand. So from their point of view, they're just at the moment going, well, interest rates are growing up. Let's put the rates up and pull some products because we can't cope with that. So again, mortgage brokers, economists, from what the sort of the picture that I'm painting is the next two years, hopefully the economy will 
settle, sort itself out uh, with whatever sort of the government or whatever external sort of variances and variables happen. Um, and then I think once that settles, we'll, I think the property market will then take off again once people become more confident um, and things start moving along. But that that's just my my view on things at the moment. If you had 200 grand available to go and invest tomorrow, where would you, and I see that you've got locations in Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, and London, like which, which of those would you put your money or is there somewhere else that you'd put your money? Is this somewhere else? Um, there's probably three locations I would be looking at and it would just depend on what investment sort of strikes me at that point. First would be Manchester. Manchester is a bit more of a, a probably maybe the safer option. Uh, it's had a lot of regeneration. Uh, you've got a lot of big businesses going there. The city centre is doing very well. It's um, very, very strong market. They've had a lot of growth already, um, but it's got very strong rental markets. So I'd potentially looking at Manchester and they've still got a 15 year or so regeneration plan in the pipeline. So you can see there's more to happen there um, and the prices are fair. So that would be the first one. Second would be Liverpool. Lot, lot further behind in terms of Manchester, in, in terms of the, the property cycle and the regeneration that's taking place there because they're only just starting. So that would be kind of my my one where I'd be taking a bit more of a risk because they're not, it's not as established. Um, but again, great bring rental market, great sales market as well. So doing very strong. And the third would be Leeds. Um, and that's because I've, I've got a couple of investments in Leeds myself. I know the area, and again, as a city, it's strong. And then probably the three connecting factors of all of those is you've got the HS2 um, links, which are in the pipeline as well. So again, yeah. I've got the medium to long-term view and I'd be sort of focusing on those. And if I had one more as um, just on the off the cuff, it would be Birmingham because I think Birmingham's still got um, quite a bit. It's now sort of a financial hub with Goldman Sachs, et cetera, going there. HS2, the ball, the ball rings all been revamped and again lots of regeneration going on in Digbeth, Smithfields there's there's lots going on so those probably the areas that I'd, I'd be putting my money it's interesting um yeah you've you've got your finger on the pulse there <laughs> I like the speed uh, that you're able to kind of ring off all those places um some of the habits and behaviors Toby I like to kind of just delve into this for a little bit um you've got a lot of people listening into this podcast and they're, they're thinking of getting into property or they're already kind of, you know, dabbling in property and stuff like that. I mean, what would you say are the kind of the real habits and behaviors that set the, the, the successful apart from the rest of them? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I think, I think firstly, you've, you've got to have, I think, determination because I think a lot of people think in their mind, you go find a property, you make an offer, you buy it, it's done doesn't work like that you might have your first deal fall through you might have the vendor pull out you might have a bad survey there's it's not as straightforward so you need that determination to not get sort of broken down by it and then carry on to the next one because perseverance yeah it, exa exactly that um I, i've had two deals fall out of bed before i found the one that actually went through um and you will lose money on surveys etc and that's part of the process and a lot of people don't understand understand that and i think once that happens they get bitten and they think oh I'm, i don't want to do this anymore so definitely determination and perseverance i think patience is key in property a lot of people think property is, is a overnight thing where you'll you'll be rich and it's really easy it's not it's patience um you look at anybody that's done well in property it, it usually has taken a long time of building it up and then sort of building on that and becoming like a snowball effect. So you definitely need patience. Um, and I think willingness to sort of learn and take stuff in because you, you need to, you need to look at what other people are doing. You need to look at markets. I mean, if you want to be hands-off then yes, there's companies such as ourselves, which again, we're looking at new and off plan. So if you're looking for very desirable yields, we're not the company. We're giving you a lot more hands-off, lower sort of um, yielding options in that sense. But because it's hands-off, it's new, it's shiny, easy to rent out, good location. Um, and again, you need to factor in, if you're going to go down that route, you need to give your trust into someone. So that's that. But I always say you need to do your own due diligence and research. And then lastly, adaptability. You need to be able to adapt to different scenarios, um, different deals. Um, so you need to be a bit fluid in that sense. Um, and yeah, 
that's probably the sort of the main and emotion as well. You need to you need to in a sense take emotion out of it because it is a business. When you're investing in property, it's called property investment, but it's still a business and treat you need to treat it like a business. So try and pull that emotion away from it. It's very hard to do, but taking the emotion out, like if you're running a business, is, is definitely something I recommend. Yeah. No, I think that those last couple are really they resonate with me. All right. You know, the emotional side, that's one of the big things that I talk about in this podcast is just kind of remove the emotion. If somebody offers you, you know, a low ball price on the deal, it's not an insult. Like it's just that mm. that that could be where the market is, or it's their first, yeah. you know, it's their first attempt at doing a deal. Um, in terms of your own um, you know, looking back, if you kind of one of the questions that I like to ask my guests is, you know, you're 30 in your mid thirties now, Toby. Okay. So 15 years ago, you're fresh face coming out of college. You've just bought a pub. Like what would you say, what advice would you give yourself now knowing 15 years on what it's like? Did you do anything back then that, or did you have a mindset back then that you think you should, you're different now? Yeah, I think, um, Probably two. I think first thing I would have done is um, probably told myself buy a property um, because I remember I had, fast. Yeah, yeah, I had the opportunity to, and I kind of I, I wasn't aware of the scenario. It was kind of just had a bit of extra capital, so I was going to maybe buy a property, and I, I never did. And if I had of, um, looking back to today, obviously it's a common thing with a lot of people you speak to would have done very well from that. That would probably be the first thing. Just jump in and do it. Doesn't matter what you buy, just buy it. Get on the ladder. Um, and then secondly, a mix of two things. It would have been one, be sort of more maybe confident and bullish in myself. And, and again, there's a lot of thought process I had back then, but where I was quite young, didn't think I had maybe the the capacity to, to action it or, or maybe I'd question myself because I am only young. Maybe what I'm thinking isn't correct. I haven't got the life experiences. But then on the flip side is is also maybe listen to people with life experience or 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 try and get more information of people with life experience and more. I think there's opportunities and there's people I've been around where if I'd ask questions and really sort of sat down and maybe tried to get to know them and how they think that could have maybe helped sort of me a lot quicker, or I could have had a lot more value from that as well. Yeah. I think you're spot on there. I think a huge amount of people and it's, it's not necessarily young people. It's, it's all sorts but they have self-limiting beliefs. And uh, it's funny, a guest I had on, you know, a couple of months ago was a guy in his, I think he's in his mid fifties and he's, he's, he's got a property portfolio now that, you know, supports his lifestyle and he's not working as much. In, but it, he only started it five or six years ago. The guy like, uh, and I said like, why, you know, you're, you're a property agent. You, you have been dealing in property for your entire career and you weren't actually buying it yourself. Like, why weren't you? And he said exactly that. It's like, I just self-limiting beliefs were kind of holding them back, you know? So all the way up and down, like it's really, it's about getting inside your head and, and really kind of understanding the process. And a lot of the time having some sort of a coach or a mentor helps. Do you, did you have any of that kind of thing to, to benefit from? I, I, I did, but organically. So it wasn't, it wasn't like I reached out to someone and asked, but I think in, in, in most sort of maybe companies I've been with, like when I was at the estate agency, I had, I had a branch manager who I really sort of gelled would gelled with very well um, and learned a lot from him. Um, again, he, he would sort of take me under, under his wing, sort of take me out on, on a lot of valuations, going to meet developers, pricing up stuff. So that was really good. Um, that was probably sort of the main one. And then yeah, I think in terms of that, it was mainly sort of taking on external learning myself, just trying to see who's out there, see what they're doing and see if I can sort of replicate it in any way. I've Yeah, I probably it's it's one of those things where I think education is key and the right education is always key. And I think, yeah, having that mentor, I mean, I, if I speak to sort of younger people now, um, sort of early 20s, maybe just sort of coming out of, of, of college and stuff, I'm always trying to sort of, get in their head and sort of, sort of really what are they thinking because I, again that world at that age is very different to what the world is like in our eyes anyway mm. so again um when they have their ideas it's i just i just try and really sort of get them to sort of elaborate push on it and then try and sort of guide them in the right direction that's something i've noticed a lot lately is when i'm speaking to people it's, it's quite refreshing to see a lot of my life lessons can now interpret it in maybe other businesses or what other people are doing and it's really refreshing and i'm sitting there talking and they're like 
And I don't realize I'm just talking to them because I've got things coming into my head and I'm listening to what they're saying. I'm giving my interpretation and just throwing some ideas out. And I've got friends with businesses. I've got uh, sort of younger people that just sort of just talk to me, sort of family, friends and stuff. And they, they sort of now appreciate the advice I've sort of given them. And that that's quite refreshing. I don't think you always understand what you've learned through the processes that you've, that you've gone through um, yeah, over, over a, that lifetime. There's a, there's a saying that, um, a lot of people don't realize that you're standing on a mountain of value. And most people, when they're, you know, they, they don't realize just how much knowledge and, you know, experience that they've accumulated. And they're constantly looking at other areas, not realizing that they're standing on something really powerful themselves. Uh, Tommy, to, you know, final question. Um, the best advice that you've received over your career, do you, can you, can it, does, what pops into mind? It's, it's something that I actually, yeah, so to, it's, it's sort of business and I managed to sort of take that into property. So the one thing that sticks out is when I was an estate agent, um, one of my sort of head, head uh, sort of line managers, he, he always used to say, it's not what you book, it's what you bank. And then when I, I sort of took that from, because an estate agent, I can go and do a deal, say I was an estate agent, I could do 10 deals this month. If they, they all fall through, made zero money and the company's made zero money so that really resonated with me because again with with property investing it's not the deal that you agree and negotiate and you you get that all shake hands and that's all good but it's, it's it actually once you exchange complete it actually then comes to fruition that's kind of always set up my mindset that I'm, I'm never sort of done until it's done I don't just rest on my laurels and just because I've got that price agreed and we're going through the process is done deal. So I'm always got that mentality of what if, what if, and I'm thinking two steps ahead, like what do I need to look out for? And is there any warning signs or do I need to prep for the for the next deal? Cause it's going to get going to get a bit wobbly. And it's the same with business. Um, I think it's similar. It's to never that. done until it's done. It, exactly. And it, then, it, then I heard someone else use the, the phrase once, um, isn't it revenues vanity profit sanity and then i linked the two together and it's just yeah they, they both work quite well so that's probably the one thing that that sticks out and i've kind of taken through and been able to sort of put into different avenues of, of what i do today brilliant okay well look toby uh, thanks so much for all of your uh you know time today uh, if somebody was wanting to kind of learn more about you or your company track capital what's the best way to get in contact and to learn more yeah so um track capital websites the, the best way to find us as a company so that's www.trackcapital.co.uk um i'm or we're on all the social medias but if you if you wanted to reach out to me personally as well that's absolutely fine um linkedin toby mancuso um instagram uh, toby mancuso property um if you use any of those you, you'll be able to find me quite easily uh, mancuso is not the most obvious name in most yeah, uh, circumstances yeah that and property you, you should be able to find me no problem <laughs> i'll put some links in the show notes but uh toby thanks so much for your time today and uh Good luck with everything you're working on. And uh, maybe we'll meet in Dubai sometime. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Thank you very much for having me. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Toby Mancuso. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Behind the Facade. If you enjoyed that episode or if you found it useful in any way, please take a moment to leave a, a review over on iTunes if you're listening in on the podcast. If you're listening or you're watching in on the YouTube channel, then maybe you can leave us a like. And uh, if you can't do any of those things, maybe just share the episode out with somebody you think would find it useful. If you have any questions or topics you'd like me to cover, uh, send me a message through the Facebook community. It's probably the best one to go for. That is called Behind the Facade Community. Alternatively, you'll find me on social media. My handle is Gavin J. Gallagher. And uh, as you would expect, I have a website that has the same name, gavinjgallagher.com. If you go in there, you can join the email list. You can add yourself in there and you can find out what's going on on the various projects that I am working on. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this one. Speak to you again next week.